if you wait here, the doctor will see you in a few minutes. Oh, Jennifer, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm going to sit in on a personal interview with the Dr. Wilbur. If you want to be quiet, there won't be any interview. The doctor is very shy. She has a nice place though. Does anyone live here with Dr. Wilbur? No, ma'am. Of course I'm not one to gossip. But I always thought this house needed another touch. Now if you ask me... <gasps> Heavens! The doctor is coming. I have to get back to the kitchen. Alright, we can talk about Dr. Wilbur's marital status later. And I say, Wilbur, did you pay entirely too much attention to trivialities? You miss important clues by sorting out the little things. I have my way, Professor Adams. It was once said that there are many roads to heaven. Well, I feel the same about the detection of a crime. Ah, oh, the little things. They always tell me about the big things. I can't agree. Your method is old-fashioned. Your style is outdated. If my methods and style are at fault, at least let me salvage something of my manners. We have guests and we continue to prattle like two washwomen. Dr. Wilbur, this is a pleasure. My name is Jennifer Turner of the Weekly Dispatch. Ah, yes, you're the young woman who wishes to interview me for her paper. That's right. My memoirs will make pretty stodgy reading, I'm afraid. Oh no, Dr. Wilbur, that's not true. Why everyone has heard about your work on solving crime? Our readers want some inside information about your methods. My methods, again. My good colleague, Professor Adams, would have something to say about my methods. No offense intended, Doctor. I only said that one can't dwell on the little things anymore. The scientific method of crime reduction has eliminated all that. Uh, this is indeed an age of wonders. The world of science has even perfected a crime-solving machine. Yes, the days of Sherlock Holmes and Sid by the Fire Reduction have come to an end. You may be right. Uh, but we have neglected this young lady. This is Miss Helen Porter. She's a friend of mine on the paper. She wanted to come to the interview. I always wanted to meet you. Uh, well, I hope you're not disappointed, young lady. I have just been called a defeated old-fashioned husband. Now, Dr. Wilbur, I just Oh, Adams, you're forgiven. I can't blame you for criticizing me. Everyone finds fault with me. Why, even Annie, my maid, feels that I need a man in this house. She disapproves of my bachelor life. Oh, uh, she has spoken to you about it, too? Well, uh, oh, you needn't feel uncomfortable. Annie has discussed it with everyone, from the church parson to the bread man. She did mention something about it. That's all right. But despite your modern methods, I will still ride along with the little things. The things that everyone overlooks. What good are these little things? Maybe they're a waste of time, but everything must be examined in crime deduction, especially the simple things in our lives. The simple things? What do you mean? Well, uh, I might illustrate. Uh, take that telephone, for instance. Well, what about it? It's a common enough phone, if you ask me. Yes, it's a simple dial phone. A very commonplace object. We use the telephone every day of our lives. We dial exchanges and numbers with reckless abandon. But has anyone ever noticed the amazing peculiarity of that phone? Are you trying to fool us, Doctor? There's nothing wrong with this phone. That is true, but although you often use the phone, Adams, can you tell me anything about the dial? What are you driving at? I think Dr. Wilbur wants to know something about the arrangements of the numerals and letters on the dial. Good girl, that's precisely what I want. Well, it's a simple dial. The letters are grouped in series of threes, and there are nine numbers, well, ten counting the zero. And then there's well, but this is sheer nonsense. But it's very important if I'm to prove my point about the little things. You just said that the letters are arranged in groups of threes. How is this possible if there are 26 letters in the alphabet? 26 is not divisible by three. Really, I've never paid much attention to such things. Precisely, just as that little detail escaped you and a thousand others, so may crime go undetected if one does not heed the little things. You've really interested me on the problem of the phone, Doctor. As I recall, there are no letters left over. They are all arranged in groups of threes. But that can't be done with 26 letters. I have it! 26 letters are not used on a telephone. Now let me see. There are eight groups of letters. Why that means that two letters are omitted from a telephone dial? 
a very enterprising young woman. You're on the right track, but unfortunately you have forgotten that Set is left over and stands alone. Thus only one letter is omitted. Now, young lady, can you tell me what letter it is? Well, uh, I think it's the X. I think the people with an Exeter exchange would be sadly <laughs> bewildered about that. No, that is not right. I give up. I think I'm not as smart as that. Oh, it's not brightness. I doubt whether Mr. Einstein could have told me about the missing letter. No, it's merely concentration on the little things. I've had enough telephone mysteries for today. I wish we could solve real life cases as easily. Take those jewel robberies, for example. Are you talking about those two cases down on Leicester Street last month? Are you working on those? No, the police are handling those cases, or trying to handle them at any rate. I work only on cases where I'm privately consulted, you see. Oh. You sound disappointed, Miss Porter. Well, I would like to have seen you at work. I told them you were not available. I told them that they wouldn't listen. But I have to talk to you, Dr. Wilbur. Please, help me. Uh, help you, young lady. Uh, but of course, uh, you're the girl I've often seen in the garden across the street. Yes, we've been neighbours for years. And you're Vincent Dudley. Uh, really, your mystery stories have often kept me up past my bedtime. Uh, I'd like you to meet Vincent Dudley, my neighbour, although I must admit he moves in a literary circle. Mr. Dudley, I read all your books. I'm guilty too. I wrote enough of them. I'm stumped now. That's why I, I mean, we need your help, Dr. Wilbur. Won't you, Dudley, sit down and make yourselves comfortable? I am very honoured to be called upon for help, but fiction is really out of my line. I am not too good at creating mysteries. But, but this is not a fictional mystery, Doctor. It isn't? No. I'm afraid a real-life mystery has been planted right on our doorstep. You can see, Vincent, that Dr. Wilbur is entertaining friends tonight. We can't very well occupy his time with such nonsense. It isn't nonsense, Mother. Oh, please, Dr. Wilbur, won't you help us? There, there, my dear. I'm sure your trouble is not that serious. It's a storm in a teacup. You're making a terrible fool of yourself, Pam. I am sure that Larry will turn it in a little while and have a great laugh at our expense. Larry? Larry Parker is my daughter's fiancé. Oh, I see. And he's disappeared. He disappeared into thin air. Look, here. This is his picture. I, I want you to find him for me. Well, miss, a little while ago I was speaking to my friends about my marital status. I'm not too well acquainted with such things. But he certainly seems to be a very handsome young man. There, Pam, I told you that Dr. Wilbur would not listen to you. Oh, I'll be glad to listen, but if her young man has chosen to disappear, I'm afraid there's little I can do. Oh, Dr. Wilbur, but it isn't what you think. Larry hasn't left me. Just like that. Please, let me explain. What Pam means is that Larry hasn't just gone away because of some foolish lover's quarrel. Larry Parker, uh, Larry has disappeared practically before our eyes. Disappeared? Yes, he yes, disappeared. Miss. Larry Parker has vanished. Yes, he disappeared in the impossible room. The impossible room? Yes. <sighs> He's gone. And I don't know where to find him. You have aroused our curiosity, but thin air, the impossible room, I think we'll need a little explanation. I think we'll need quite an explanation. My daughter, uh, my wife and my daughter are not too good at mysteries. I'm afraid they have left you hanging on a limb. Please, let me explain the trouble as briefly as possible. Please do so. Mr. Parker, Larry, has arrived at our home at four this afternoon. He was to spend the weekend with us. <sighs> you see, we were planning to announce our engagement formally tomorrow night. <sighs> it was going to be a double occasion for us. The engagement and the publication of my new book next week. Naturally, the talk turned to mysteries. Larry's quite an enthusiast. Larry wanted an outline of the plot, and since the new book deals with the problem of a locked room, Larry was quite fascinated. A locked room? Yes. 
the problem in my book in the book dealt with a man who escapes from a locked room. Oh, I remember those things. Sliding panels and all that stuff. I guess the sliding panel is a thing of the past. It isn't considered fair to spring the sliding panel to the reader anymore. Hmm. That was old fashioned, Adams. Uh, please continue, Mr. Dudley. I thought that Larry's air was quite arrogant. He said that he could solve my problem of the locked room and could do me one better by escaping from a locked room himself. The whole suggestion of the locked room business was his own idea. Yes, I wanted to forget the subject, but Larry was quite insistent. He demanded that I take his challenge. And what was the challenge? He said that he could escape from a locked room without the aid of keys, sliding panels, or even an outside confederate. He said that he could escape from the impossible room. You mentioned that room a little while ago, miss, and I'm quite fascinated and a little perplexed. What is the impossible room? The impossible room is a pet name for an old room in the second floor of our house. It lies in the line of our sleeping rooms but it has one outstanding peculiarity. You see, there is only one entrance to the room, namely the door leading to the hall. The door has a spring latch that can only be opened from outside. Oh, the lock will not work from inside. Why? I was locked in that dreadful room for two hours one day before the men heard me pounding on the walls. A peculiar room indeed. Now, why should it lock only from the outside? The impossible room is not a room at all. It's more like a it's more like a closet pantry often found in these old houses. The house belonged to my grandfather and he used it as a storage place for papers and old books and that stuff. Oh, I see. And uh, I suppose the window in the room is too small to offer escape. Oh, um there, there is no window, doctor. No window. The only entrance is the door. The room is built with solid walls and light up with a solitary dim lamp on the ceiling. After we moved in, we threw away all the old papers and books Grandfather gathered there. Yeah, the room is completely empty, Dr. Wilbur. And very solid. And Mr. Parker boasted that he could escape from that room. He not only boasted, Doctor, he did escape. This whole thing started simply enough, but I'm afraid there's something sinister about it. Oh, Dr. Wilbur, do you think Larry's in danger? Who can tell? Please, go on with your story. Finally, I consented to Larry's plan. It, it was agreed that he would be locked in the room for a half hour, and after that time, he should present himself downstairs. Just as simple as that? Yes, of course, he didn't tell us his plan for escape, but knowing the impossible room, I was quite fascinated, uh, I was quite interested to, to see him try. And who locked Parker in the impossible room? I, I did. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You probably feel that Larry could free himself and was hiding someplace laughing at us. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. But it's not true. I know the door was locked. I know it. I tried it after Larry went into the impossible room and the door wouldn't budge. I believe you, Miss Pam, but I must have more details. The little things again. Yes, the little things. Tell me everything, no matter how unimportant it may seem. I want exact details from the time Parker went up to that room until you made certain the door was locked. Now, let me see. When Father gave his permission that Larry could be locked up in the impossible room, I was terribly excited. You see, I'm a mystery fan too. I can appreciate that. <laughs> well, Larry and I left the living room and went up to the second floor to the room, Larry leading the way. You say you and Larry, uh, didn't you go along too? Uh, well, no, I'm afraid my agent called and we had a quite lengthy conversation about my new book. And you, Mrs. Dudley? Heavens, no! I don't indulge in mysteries. Besides, I just returned from upstairs. 
I brought my jewels up to the bedroom, as I remember. Your jewels? Why, yes. I usually keep my jewels in the bank vault, but I took them out earlier in the afternoon in honor of the engagement. Go upstairs again? I should say not. Once up and down the stairs is quite enough for a woman of my age. And you left the jewels in your bedroom? Yes, of course. I see. Thank you, Mrs. Dudley. Please continue. When we got upstairs, Larry went right to the room. He quickly turned the knob and walked in. He laughed and said something about Shadini and closed the door after him. You didn't go into the room? No, Larry had already closed the door, but he went into the room. I saw him with my own eyes. Yes, of course. <laughs> I made certain that the outer spring latch was securely fastened and then... <sighs> and then... Uh, please, Miss Dudley. But this is the part that I can't understand. You see, I didn't want Larry to escape without any knowledge, and I thought it would teach him some good lesson about praying, so I... I... Yes? <sighs> I ran some tape around the door jam so that Larry couldn't possibly get out. You see, if the tape were broken, I would know that he had some secret way of opening the door from the inside. Of course, I knew the tape wouldn't hold the door, but the tape would snap instantly if the door were tampered with. I see. And what did you do then? I called something to Larry to make doubly sure that he was in the room, and he answered behind the locked door. Did you wait outside the door long? No, I wanted to get downstairs right away. I was anxious for this whole business to be over. But you told me you were enthusiastic about Larry's plan. It started out as a joke, but I was a little frightened. Larry was so sure of himself. He... it frightened me. And you went right downstairs? Yes. And nothing else happened? No, nothing. There must be something else. There has to be. I... I don't know what you mean. I tell you that my honoured friend, Professor Adams, thinks I am old-fashioned. That may be true, but in order to help you, I must know about the little things. The little things? Yes, every detail that happened from the time you locked the impossible room until you joined your mother and father downstairs. There's nothing to tell. I made certain that the door was locked, that Larry couldn't get out, and I went downstairs. That's all, Dr. Wilbur. You met no one in the hall or on the stairs? No one. No one could have helped Larry escape. The door was locked and securely taped. I didn't think it was possible for Larry to get out of this room. Why, I even stepped back to admire the good work I had done in the room and then... But, of course, that wouldn't interest you. What is it? Oh, it's foolish. It's nothing, really. As I said, I stepped back and... As the hall was quite dark, I bumped into Mr. Abercrombie. Who? Oh, Pam, I don't think that Dr. Wilbur will be interested in <sighs> Mr. Abercrombie. I am interested in every aspect of this case, madam. Now, who is Mr. Abercrombie? Mr. Abercrombie is a pet name for an old suit of armour that stands in the hall. A suit of armour? Yes, it belonged to grandfather and we kept it, well, for sentimental reasons. Mm. Oh, where does that suit of armor stand? Tell me, where does it stand? <laughs> it stands directly across the impossible room. It's in line with the door. And you stepped backwards and crashed into it? Y yes, yes, but I can't see what that means. It makes the case a little more difficult, <sighs> that's all. If you had mistaken the door of the impossible room and had locked Mr. Parker in another room, <sighs> the suit of armor wouldn't have stood behind no, you. No, that's true. Oh, that makes everything worse. And Mr. Abercrombie was behind me, directly across the impossible room. Before I can say anything about this business, I must know a little more about the upstairs hallway. It's a simple hall, really. There are four doors opening to the hallway. Who occupies these rooms? I have the first room, my bedroom. Then there's the impossible room. Beyond that, there's the room of my mother. And then the fourth room is the room of my father's bedroom and study. Are the doors all the same? Yes, they're all uniform in size and colour, but of course only the door to the impossible room cannot be opened from the inside. The others can. I see. In other words, if a door to the other bedrooms is locked from the outside, that door can be easily opened by turning the knob from the inside. Yes, that's the only difference. And that will explain. Uh, but never mind. What happened after you joined your parents downstairs? Well, we, we waited for Larry to turn up. It was a rough half hour too, 
Oh, it was almost an hour, Vincent. Don't you remember that you were a little alarmed at six when Larry hasn't appeared? It was horrible, just sitting there, watching, waiting, and no sound from upstairs. At six o'clock, I decided that this nonsense has gone far enough. We went up to the impossible room. The door was still locked and the table was in place. Even Mr. Abercrombie was standing watching us. I think that Mr. Abercrombie could tell us many interesting things. And then I called to Larry and got no answer. We pulled the tape off the door and I turned the knob, released the outside spring latch. We went into the room, into the dark, and I snapped on the light. You put on the light, madam. Yeah, the room was in complete darkness, as I told you. And the room was empty. Larry had gone. That must have been a frightening moment for all of you. Frightening? It was terrifying. A man had disappeared through a two-foot solid wall. And he couldn't have been hiding in this room because there was no place to hide. What did you do? We went downstairs to wait for Larry. Naturally, I felt that he must have found a way to, to escape and was still waiting until we were in a real frenzy mm -hmm. for showing up. That was almost two hours ago and Larry is still missing. Oh, Dr. Weber, what are we going to do? Yes, Doctor, what are you going to do? There is little we can do. I'm afraid the damage has already been done. And yet, there may still be time. No doubt the doctor has been stumped at last. She's probably calling the authorities to report their disappearances. I don't want any scandal. This whole affair is absurd. Doctor, you haven't called the police. Yes, madam, I have. This is ridiculous. I only consented to come here thinking that you'll spare us the embarrassment of the police. This is more than an embarrassing situation. Don't you realize that a man has disappeared? Yes, but I... And the reason for his disappearance will cause you more disturbance than the police. What are you trying to say? There is a deep-rooted motive behind this, a fiendish scheme. What's all this, Doctor? Oh, you can put your mind at ease, all of you. I didn't ask the police to go to your house. You didn't? Of course not. I asked them to go to the Union Railroad Station and block all exits. What do you mean? The police have a fairly accurate description of your Mr. Barker. They had trouble with him before. <laughs> Larry? A criminal? I can't believe it. It's not true, Doctor. Yes, Miss Pan, it's true enough. It has to be that way. It's the only solution to the whole thing. You knew him only a short time. You told me that you were announcing your engagement tomorrow night. Yes, I met him six weeks ago, but I won't believe anything wrong about him. Was today the first time he came to your house? No, he's been there several times. If he wanted to steal anything, why should he have waited until today? This was the best opportunity he had. The last visits were, I believe, the popular phrases, to case the place. What's all this, Dr. Wilbur? Larry Parker, alias Louis Parkman, is known by the police as one of the cleverest jewel thieves in this part of the country. No. A jewel thief? I'm sorry to say it's true. Oh, yes, he was at your house before, and he must have thought it ingenious when he remembered the impossible room. This is all too confusing. On the contrary, Mr. Dudley, it's amazingly simple. Consider, if your house guest were to call upon you and leave unexpectedly, one might think it rather strange and immediately search one's own personal belongings. That's right. However, if there were a strange <coughs> cloak of mystery about the guest's disappearance, one would be involved with the problem at hand. In other words, Larry Parker wanted to give you something to occupy your minds while he ransacked your house and made off with your jewels. My jewels? Yes, madam. Parker probably decided that he would have them at home to wear to the engagement party tomorrow night and again to the literary functions with your husband next week. Well, yes, j just as I told you, I brought them out earlier in the afternoon out of the bank vault. A jewel thief uses a great deal of psychology, and most often he's correct. If he wanted your jewels, he had to take them today. He had no time to lose. And in the clever hands of a man like Larry Parker, it was child's play. Well, I wouldn't call disappearing from a locked room exactly child's play. 
We'll discuss that later, Adams, but first I think mm. Mr. Dudley should go back to his house and examine Mrs. Dudley's jewel box. Yes, yes, of course. The little calf box, you know, the second drawer of my dresser. Uh, Mr. Dudley, uh, would you mind if I sent my two young friends here along with you? I think they'd like a little assignment. I think that the report will prove my theory. Well, heaven help you if it doesn't. <laughs> I... I still can't believe it. It's fantastic. People aren't always what they seem. Upon close examination, they often appear quite unfavourable. Yes, looking at the little things is often cruel, but always accurate. The little things again. Yes, the little things. This is a crime that might defy detection under the microscope of your scientific crime study. And yet, the little things solved it easily enough. When everything is put in its place, the answer is there. I still don't see how you plan to get around that impossible room business. Granted that Parker might have stolen the crown jewels of England at some point or another, how did he manage to get out of that locked room? Yes, Dr. Wilbur, you haven't answered that. Let's put it this way, Miss Pan. We have a seemingly impossible problem at hand. Is this young man gifted with strange supernatural powers which enable him to defy locked doors and concrete walls? Nonsense. No, but... Then we must look for a logical answer. You saw him go into the room. You locked the door. You taped the door. The man disappeared. That is a chain of events, and somewhere there is a weak link which will solve the entire problem. But everything you mention is true. No, Pam. One of the statements must be incorrect. Let us examine them again. First of all, Mr. Parker is missing. We have your father's and mother's verification of that. That's true. Then we let that stand for the moment. Secondly, you taped the door. I did! Mother and father will swear to that too. They saw the tape when we went upstairs to the impossible room. Very good. Let's look at the next statement. You locked the door. <laughs> I did! I tried it after Larry went into the room and the door wouldn't budge. Well, that brings us to the first statement. We have reason to believe that the last three impressions are correct, so the fault must lie in the first statement. And that statement was, I saw him go into the impossible room. <laughs> he... he did. He even talked to me behind the closed door. Oh, we believe that he entered a room well enough, but what room? That's the question. Uh, I... I don't follow you. It was a very easy matter for Parker to escape from the locked room. You see, Miss Pam, Larry never went into the impossible room. Oh, that is foolish, Wilbur. We have Miss Dudley's evidence. We have the evidence of an excited, nervous girl in a poorly lighted hallway. She saw Parker go into a room. Well, was he not planning to go into the impossible room? Therefore, the mere fact that he entered a room, any room, would instantly establish the place as the impossible room. I... I can't believe I've been mistaken. You were mistaken. Miss Parker wanted you to be mistaken. Wasn't it his idea in the first place to pursue the question of the locked room? Yes, that's right. He brought the subject up. You see, the stage was all arranged. He knew that the four doors were identical in size and colour. He knew that if he played his cards cleverly, he could lead you to any door of his choice and in the confusion make you believe that you were standing in front of the impossible room. <laughs> but I can't believe I would have made such a mistake. It was late afternoon, dusk, the most deceiving time of all. Oh yes, it could very easily have happened. Oh, it wasn't your fault. The power of suggestion is an amazing thing. It often makes us see the things that don't exist at all. And Parker was clever, remember that. But how can you be so sure that this is true? It's a flimsy explanation, if you ask me. It's the only possible solution. I first suspected it when Pam mentioned the similarity of doors, and I knew I was right when she mentioned Mr. Abercrombie. Mr. Abercrombie? But that makes you wrong. I stepped into that old suit of armour when I moved back, and Mr. Abercrombie faces the impossible room. I'm afraid he didn't this afternoon. Mr. Abercrombie was an unwitting member of the plot. Parker knew that you would be more convinced that he was in the impossible room if you were to see some undeniable landmark that you would associate with the room. Therefore, if the suit of armour were moved in front of the mother door... Why, one would think that that is the door to the impossible room. That wretched young man to deceive Pam this way. You, you say the suit of armour was moved? Yes, miss. It was moved in front of your mother's room, the third door. Uh, this is what happened. Parker went ahead of you and entered your mother's room. Remember, he quickly closed the door before you had any chance to enter. 
In the dark hallway, and with the added impression of the suit of armor in front of the door, you released the spring lock on the outside and thought he was imprisoned. But all the bedroom doors can be opened from the inside. Precisely. When Parker knew you were safely downstairs, he ransacked your mother's jewel box, opened the door from the inside, stepped into the hallway, and moved the suit of armor back to its original position in front of the impossible room. But that's not right. If I made a mistake, then the tape would be on mother's door and not on the impossible room as we found it. That's right, Dr. Wilbur. I'm afraid you figured too quickly this time. Adams, I'm surprised at you. Would it not be unbelievably easy for Parker to rip the tape off the third door and then secure a new roll of tape to use on the door of the impossible room? Well... Parker must have laughed at your feeble attempt, Miss Pam. He went right along with you and studied carefully just how the tape was used. He could have gotten the tape easily enough, I suppose. Yes. As a matter of fact, I always keep some in my room. You mean that Parker taped the door? Of course, I told you, a great deal of planning went into this deed. When the second door was taped and the suit of armor moved back to its original position, he merely stole out of the house and headed for the nearest railroad station. Mrs. Dudley's jewels were safely in his pocket. You... you were right, Dr. Wilbur. We found a jewel box. Empty! Empty? I had a diamond necklace that was a family heirloom. And my rings! Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Dudley, but the jewels are gone. Everything. Then, then it's true. Everything's true about Larry. I... What am I going to do? It's very hard for you, miss, but it's really better this way. I know you'll find happiness again. I hope you find it very soon. Oh, you're kind, Dr. Wilbur. It's silly to be crying, I know, but Larry seems so different. I... I thought he loved me. There are some people who value only the material things in life. Larry is one of those people. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, this is Dr. Wilbur. You did? Good, good, yes, I understand. Oh, that's very good. Yes, goodbye. I think we've just seen the last act of The Impossible Room. They they found Larry? Yes, at Union Railroad Station. And my jewels? He had them in a briefcase. The police will hold them as evidence, but everything is safe. I don't know how I can thank you, Dr. Wilbur, for putting our minds at ease. Yes, and I brought a little unhappiness, too. Oh, it's all right, Dr. Wilbur. I'll get over it, I suppose, but... And who knows? Maybe... Someday, I'll find someone who cares more for me than does for mother's tools. Young people forget very easily, Pam. That's in your favour. Now that you know your neighbours, we hope you won't be a stranger anymore. No, indeed. Farewell. And goodbye, Mrs. Dobby. And I think you got enough material for your interview. Yes, but you have to explain the whole locked room business to us. Ah, uh, yes, I forgot you were absent when I explained how Parker managed everything so cleverly. I'd like to know one thing first. Yes, young lady? Going back to our own little problem. Just what was the missing letter on the dial form? Yes, that's something I want to know too. I've done enough sleuthing for one night. The problem of the telephone dial is something for you to solve.